Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week on this show, I invite a girlfriend to join me and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. In the Doing the Best You Can motherhood journey, the days are long, but the years are short. In her new book, Sacred Ground, Sticky Floors, Jamie Amarine delivers a totally relatable account of her hilarious and honest misadventures in motherhood. Best of all, she'll introduce you to the one whose presence turns sticky floors into sacred ground. You can find Sacred Ground, Sticky Floors at your favorite book retailer today. Hey friends, I am so giddy for you to listen to my conversation with today's guest. Juliana Zobris has been a dream guest of mine since the 2015 World Series. I watched her husband, Ben, play for the Kansas City Royals that year. They won the World Series and I was so drawn to her because she was a wife supporting her husband, also doing amazing things in her own career. And she was about 39 weeks pregnant when they won. I love getting to know her and you're going to love this episode. She's now wife to a Chicago Cubs because Ben now plays for the Cubs and they also won a World Series. She's mom to three. She's a pop singer and author of Pull It Off. Today, we talk about baseball and marriage, the journey of discovering why she believes we are creating the image of God. It's a great conversation. Raising her kids with both parents being in the public eye, her new book about facing fears and living free of the shoulds that we put on ourselves and others. I know you're gonna love listening to Juliana's faith story and the down-to-earth, relatable person that she is. Guys, I wanna remind you that we have some great Christmas gifts over at our Happy Hour store. You can log over there at jamieivy.com slash store. There are sweatshirts, there are cool t-shirts, there are books by myself and my husband that we can sign for you. This is the last week for you to order merchandise and get it in time for Christmas. So check that out. There is something there for people on your list. Okay, you guys, here is my conversation with my friend, Juliana Zobrist. Hey, Juliana, welcome to the Happy Hour. Thank you. This is fun because can I just tell you a little bit about why you're on my dream list? Yes, please. I would love to. Hear okay, this. so people, my listeners might not all even know who you are, but I have known who you are for a couple of years because let me tell you this real quick. I love baseball. It's my one of my favorite sports, but you will probably agree the season is so dang long. It's so long. I only start watching in the playoffs. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so like last night I was up till 1 a.m. watching the Astros lose. Yes. Okay, but still, I love baseball, but I don't have the time for the regular season. Right. Okay? 162 games. Nobody has that time unless Not you're actually the wife. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We can talk about it. But I, when I was watching the World Series in 2015, yes, Kansas City Royals is where your husband, Ben, was playing. And they kept talking about his wife who was like <laughs> about to pop out a baby any day. Yes. And so I also love the wives of the sport, I'm a sports girl, so I love sports, but I love the wives. Mm -hmm. Like I will follow all the Astros wives or girlfriends. They're like, you know, so I like catch on to that. Because I think behind this baseball player that we're watching, there's this phenomenal woman. Yes. And so I start following you then and watch the whole thing. And then I see you guys go to the Cubs and I see the World Series and the MVP. And so I have been a fan of yours Uh, since 2015. Thank you. Because I get to see you do something that I'm super passionate about, which is support your man super well Mm -hmm. and also chase your dreams really hard. Mm -hmm. And so that happens in my household. And so it's been fun to watch you. You have been an encouragement to me from afar. And so- Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I'm so thrilled to be here. Okay, so let's, I'm just gonna say, this is what I know about you. And then we're gonna start talking because this is our first time to meet. So we're just gonna get to know each other over coffee. Uh, You're a musician. I am. A mom to three. Yes. Wife to Ben. Um author, yes. book released two months ago? Uh, last month. Last month. Yeah, September You're fresh. 18th, literally a month You're ago. fresh, yeah. Today. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> so you're traveling, doing all your things. Um, but I want to know, can you take me get, because this, because this, just, just do this for me for just a second, because okay. remember I started following you and that World Series when you're about to pop out right. a baby. <laughs> Would Ben have been there for that baby during a game? No way. I wouldn't have told him. He He wouldn't have told him. 
No, I wouldn't have told That's him. what I thought you were going to say. No, he actually was like, you need to tell me if you go into labor because they were traveling, you know, yeah. and we were in the middle of the World Series. And I said, I'm not telling you. You don't do anything anyways when I have a baby. I just lay there and push <laughs> it out. Or like walk around yeah. and push it out on all fours, you know. Do we need that visual? We probably don't need uh, that we're visual. Women, all women listen okay, to the show. We know what happens. Great, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I was like, babe, I got this. Just go hit me a home run and I'll text you later a picture. <laughs> that was a very real reality of I'm about to have this baby. Yes, I was due that week. Yeah. I was due that week when we went to New York. And, and you traveled on a plane. I ended up, yes, the last game where I knew that we could win. He was like, you cannot come up unless it looks like we're actually about to win. And if you come up, you're traveling on a private airplane and you're traveling with your OBGYN, <laughs> like with your doctor. Like, okay, I can do this. So I packed a bag and the doctor came onto the flight with me with his little leather bag, you know? <laughs> this is like a movie. It's it is like a totally movie. A like movie. he's got the forceps in the bag. Oh, yeah. oh, he had all of it, like towels. That and you could have a baby on the airplane. Because I could have had that baby on the airplane. I was due. Like now literally that would have been a really, I mean, the story is great, but that would have taken it over the top. I know. <laughs> I be know. born during the World Series on a yeah. plane. Hindsight, I'm thinking that I was a little nuts for actually doing that, but I got to see the game and we won. And my doctor was yelling at me the whole time, like, stop jumping up and down. down. Stop down, jumping. Down. <laughs> He's like holding my hand, like, calm down, giving me water, making sure that I'm not on my feet too much and just trying to keep me calm. And so, but we won and it was phenomenal. And then we were, we had to take that same plane back to Kansas City. And then we found out that day um, that we were on our way back from the World Series that we had to get out of our apartment. Wait, because, why? Because we just rent like Airbnbs. And I thought- Wait, that you were renting an Airbnb in Kansas City? Right. The whole time y'all were there for his, for his season? Well, he was, we were only there for four months. He got pulled. See, I only, see, I only, I only found I you in the okay, World Series. Okay, okay. So we were playing um, in San Francisco for the A's. So we lived in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco, from April until uh, July. And then we got traded to Kansas City. So we just rented this Airbnb. For sure. Well, we didn't realize that we hadn't extended it oh through my gosh. the World Series. <laughs> so you get home. So we get home. And Ben's like, Jules, we got to move out. Like today. Okay, so let's just time out real. This is like real life problems. Like you just won the World Series, like biggest thing of your entire career. Right. Your wife's about to have your third child. Right. Hey, real life, we got to get out of our apartment. Right, exactly. And all of the diapers and the wipes and the new baby onesies and all of that is in Kansas City because I'm thinking, okay, we're just going to be like perched up here for a little bit before going home for the off season. So then we have a decision to make. We either, um, well, that night was the uh, parade mm -hmm. with the bazillion people, yes. which was so phenomenal. And I just sat and waved and <laughs> waddled around, waddled <laughs> around and like squeezed my stomach real hard to keep my baby in there and <laughs> crossed my legs and all of the things. But um, that night his parents came over and we were like, we literally have to check into a hotel oh my gosh. and wait for this baby to come because she's due. Now she was due, I think either that day or the next, or we have to get home to Nashville where we have like a house house, but I don't have any baby anything there. So I go to the doctor, the same OB that they went just with went me. To, they that just, just got a free ticket to the got, World Series. Got to, yeah. got to the World Series. Uh -huh. And he looks at me and I said, we have to leave our apartment. He goes, don't even tell me that you want to go home. I was like, I gotta go home. I can't have this baby. Can you imagine? Like room service. Can you come clean up my amniotic no, fluid? Like, no. can you even imagine that? No. I'm not having a baby in a hotel room. I'm not going to do, I can't do it. You know, I can have a baby alone while you're playing the World Series, but I can't have a baby in the hotel room. You're going to need a late checkout. Like, I can even yeah. have a baby on an airplane. That's fine. But something about a hotel room. So anyhow, we ended up taking that flight that night. We touched down in Nashville at 11 p.m. And she was born less than 24 hours later. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and then you got to go to your home home. Yeah. So we went to our home home. Yeah. Gosh, was that the best off season you've ever had? It was incredible. It was, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it was the best. It was just, yeah, it probably was, wasn't it? Yeah. I that mean, same World day, Series and Baby all in the same week. That's crazy. And my single release that day called Alive. The day like, that she was born? The day she was born, November 6th. A lot going on. Yeah, it was nuts. Well, then um, you guys got 
what do you call it? Transferred? Moved? Well, we were free agents okay, that yeah. off season. Okay. And so then, then he got to, he basically got to choose any team that offered him a deal. He got to choose which one we wanted yeah. to be on. The Chicago Cubs. Yeah, girl. Which, you know, I think a lot of people may not understand this and realize is that unlike a lot of other sports, professional ba- baseball players don't just show up in the major leagues. Uh, they put in a lot of years. Oh, yeah. A lot of years of making like $400 a month. Yeah. Of just working. Right. To get to the big to the big show. And so you guys, it looks as though, oh, look at the Zobras. They like, they've been major league baseball players and families for all this time. But there were some years leading up to that that you guys were not living like major league, I, any team can pick right. me that I want kind right. of life. Oh, no. What does that prepare you for once you get to the spot where you're in this position of like, I can go anywhere I want? Oh, my goodness. Well, that's the dream to be in that spot to get to choose. I mean, most players play in the minor leagues, which is like these little cities, you know. Most um, minor leaguers play for at least six years in the minor leagues before even getting a shot, but only less than 20% of minor leaguers ever even get a shot. That's crazy. To play one day in the major leagues. Mm-hmm. So for us to now have been in it for 12 years is just really, yeah. really astounding. Such a gift. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Well, it's been fun. I'm glad that baseball let me find you and I be able know, to see too. what you're doing. Okay, so you just released your first book. I did. You described to me what it feels like before we started talking. Tell me what it feels like to release a book. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you said. Well, I said it's like walking into a room butt naked. It's true. Like butt head to toe naked. And then people go, oh my word, she's got stretch marks. <laughs> and mm-hmm. you're like, yeah, I do. Yeah. And there's nothing I can do yeah. about it because yeah. it's out there now, you know? Now this isn't your first creative endeavor though. So me release, when I release my book in January, it's, it almost feels, even though I feel like my podcast is creative and I release it out to the world every week, but releasing the book was like, hey, here is a part of me that I've never released. But you're an artist. You've released right. music. So what, what was the difference between releasing an album, releasing a single making an EP versus putting a book out there? Well, I think because I had been educated in music, I went to Belmont University, studied music for four years. I was a classical pianist for 12, you know, grew up singing. So I was so much more used to this idea of putting out a song. But the difference between a song and a book is really astounding. And honestly, I think I I expected it to be easier than it was. I have so much respect for anybody who actually sits down and writes a book because you have the entire dictionary at your disposal. And unlike songwriting, you know, songwriting, you're limited by syllables and by rhyme and by time and by structure of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, you know. So you're, you're limited in that regard. But with book writing, the sky is the limit. You can say whatever you want to say. However, that being said, you, I loved it because it really forced me to simplify what it is that I believe and really to truly own what it is that I believe. And I realized that as I was writing, there were so many things that I wrote because I had heard it before or wrote because um, it sounded right in my head, you know, rolling off the tongue. But then I sat and thought about it and wrestled with that one sentence for an entire day or sometimes an entire week. And I realized, I don't know that I believe that. Mm. Like what? The primary thing for me was wrestling with this concept of being made in the image of God. And I've always believed that. I've always been, I would have considered myself a naturalist growing up. I saw the face of God in all of his creation. I knew that there was something, I knew that life being so complicated in the human body, being so intimate and intricate, had to have this creative mind behind it. So I've always been a God believer, but this concept of being made in the image of God was something that I always thought and would say to you, but had no idea what that truly meant. And so I, I began to research and study a lot of um, philosophy, reading Aristotle, reading Plato, reading Socrates, reading back to antiquity. These people are discussing the exact same thing that I was wrestling with while writing. And truly the same thing that we all kind of wrestle with, because it's a wildly different perspective to believe that you were created in an image of God rather than what Aristotle believes, which is that you gain an image Mm -hmm. of God or you gain knowledge of divinity, therefore become divine, as opposed to it being like placed into you. So discovering that, researching that, 
of truly believing that for the first time was really life-changing for me. Believing that you were created in the image of God. Believing that I am created in the image of God and that every man and woman is created in the image of God, regardless of belief. Mm -hmm. That He sees us by nature of being His created being, that you've been imprinted with the face of God in some way, Mm -hmm. in some way, regardless of whether or not you come to the knowledge of that, that He has imprinted Himself in you. So in a, in a sense, we're like walking fractions of him, you know? And that's revolutionary because when you believe that, then I'm no longer in competition with you. You look different than me. You have a different personality than me. You have different gifts than I do. And it used to be a source of comparison or competition for me. But now I look at it as, oh my word, this is, you are literally this fraction of God that I can't carry. Because if one of us could carry all of it, you would be Jesus. Yeah. You know, and uh-huh. been there, done that. Yeah. So none of us are able to fully, com- you know, hold and contain this image of God. So he's like divided us out on into the world. So it's almost like you, I know you grew up, your dad's pastor. Yes. So it's like you grew up with this knowledge. Oh, yes. Yeah. We're all created in the image of God. Right. And then something happened where it clicked and you went, this changes everything. It does. It changes the way that women can and should react to and with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it a, a, a collaboration instead of a competition. Uh, instead of a competition, it, it makes you appreciate and champion the differences and, and desire to find them. And even for myself, desiring now to find them in my daughter and in my, my daughters and in my son and to adorn them with that, to say, this is the image of God that he's, he's given you this mm-hmm. to carry part of himself into the world. Like how freaking fascinating yeah. is that? How do you, how do you, because you're championing that message. I can see that in you, that that is, especially I could tell over the past year and a half when you were writing yes. the book, you were, yes. that message just came out a lot in everything yeah. you did. And I was like, yes, yes. Like slow clap when you would yeah. say some things. <laughs> how do you, because you don't just live in a Christian world. Right. Like you're, you guys are not in quote unquote ministry, although we all do ministry in life. Right. You know what I mean? How does that translate for you in your everyday world with the world that you walk in that might look different from mine with my husband being a pastor? Right. It doesn't really change much to me. Um, I'm kind of the same person regardless of who I'm around. It's fun to be able to, and you know, talk to people about this and to be able to explain. You asked about my tattoo. Yes. And I'm jumping the gun. But well, I noticed. Please tell it, me. Well, it's Play-Doh. Oh. It's Plato from um, the School of Athens. Can I see? Yes. So it's not finished yet. And it's new. I can. It's brand new. I was like, I can it's feel kind the. It's feeling. Uh-huh. But, you know, now it's so fun to have this on my arm, this image of Plato himself, because the School of Athens was such a, um, such a pinnacle moment for me in my research for the book to see all of these people of antiquity discussing these concepts of divinity and humanity and where we fall in the line of it. And now people will ask me, even like on the street, who is that? What is that? And I'm like, it's Plato. And they're like, why would you get Plato? Tell you like you got right. an old dude uh-huh. tattooed on your arm. Uh-huh. And I'm like, because I believe that you were made in the image of God. So it's so, it's so fun to be able to tell people and to use that as just a, a gateway to be able to share the same message that I've been sharing with people your all whole time. Your whole life. Yeah. You wrote in your book, you said, there have been times that I have denied myself my own person in an effort to not be rejected by others. One of the most courageous things you can do is to stop apologizing for who you are. Yes. That is a message that I think we hear and we take in, but I think we have to hear it a lot because it needs to be on repeat because I feel as though so many times we want to present ourselves as a way so so we're not rejected. Right. How did you learn that? Um, Many years Many years of actually not fitting in. Many years of speaking out and going, oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. I mean, truly a, a little bit naive to, mm-hmm. um, a little bit naive to the world. But, um, but I've always wanted and desired to be sincere as a person. So to speak truth, even my own truth. Um, so I quickly realized that I would face rejection if I was going to be honest with myself and with the and world. With others, yeah. Um, but, you know, 
it's important for us to realize that um, this isn't a new thing. It's not a new problem. Um, one of the most embarrassing um, psychological studies that they've done, it, Solomon Ash did it in 1951, I believe. And they ask a, ver- a group of people um, whether this stick is longer than that stick. Is A longer or is B longer? Uh-huh. And, the, and if you look it up, like the answers are always super, super obvious. And all of the participants knew what he was doing except for the eighth person. So he told them, hey, on the fifth time when I ask you, lie. Change your, on, change, change yeah. it. Say that A is longer when really actually B is obviously longer. So participant one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is like, yeah, A is totally longer, totally longer. And you know, poor eighth <laughs> person that's like, not, is, that doesn't know is like, what on earth? Okay, I must be wrong. Uh-huh. Over 75% of the time, they always changed their answer. Mm -hmm. Isn't that nuts? It's crazy. Well, you give an example in your book, which is even more relatable. You're like, three people are out to lunch. And the waiter's like, hey, what do you want? And the first person's like, kale salad with quinoa. And the next person's like, a fruit cup. And then yeah. the third person's like, well, dang it, I wanted a burger, but I, I might as well get burger. kale salad. What is this kale thing? I yeah. just don't even understand. But it's it's so important for us to realize that on a human level, on a relational level, that we do this because we just want to be liked. Mm-hmm. We just we just want to fit in. And and there's sort of this pre-existing stamp of approval that we navigate our lives within. But you bury yourself under those things. You lo- you literally will deny your own heart to become what you think everyone wants. To become wants. what everyone else mm-hmm. says that you need to be. Yeah. And um, even just saying that out loud is you asked me initially how I came to this conclusion and how I walked through it. To say that even just out loud um, is in and of itself helpful to realize that we do this. Mm -hmm. Like we say A is longer when B is obviously longer. Yeah. We say we want a kale salad when we just want the burger. With mushrooms. With mushrooms. Swiss cheese. (laughs) That's what I want. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And yeah, we've got to stop apologizing for who we are and for being the way that God created us to be. I think as moms, sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to teach my kids this. This is important for my kids to learn this lesson. I want them to be confident in who God made them. I want them to own their stories. I want them to be everything that God has for them. And then as women, we're like, I don't know if I can do this. And so I find it really interesting and an important conversation that you're saying, this is not just something we teach our kids. This is something we teach ourselves all the time, all the day long. Um, Do you see that conversation is different between your girls and your son? Or do you Uh, see it's the same? No, it's the same. It's the same. And for me as a mom, it's catching those glances that they give where maybe they want to say something, but they're not sure if they should or shouldn't, you know? For me, there's an example in the book where I, I tell a story of my daughter and I going into a nail salon and she picked out seven colors. My daughter, Cruz, who like thinks that cartwheels is an appropriate mode of transportation. Uh-huh. She picked out seven different colors and she sat down. She's so excited. She never gets her nails done, you mm-hmm. know, and just like a mommy daughter yeah. date thing. And the woman that was painting her nails painted her pinky yellow, which was one of the seven colors. And Cruz very politely was like, oh, I really wanted pink on my pinky. Is that okay? And the woman's like, oh, sure. So she changes it and, uh, you know, no issues. And then like a few fingers later, Cruz kind of gives me the glance. Like, oh no, she messed it up again. And she didn't know if she should say anything. I'm like, you can ask her, you know. And the woman... um, so she ended up changing. Well, it happened a third time. Uh-huh. <laughs> it happened a third time. <laughs> and, and on this third time, the woman looked at me like, okay, mom, it's Can time you, for you to uh-huh. step in. And I found in myself the, the temptation. I, what I wanted to say, and I almost said, was just be grateful. Just be grateful, honey. It's fine. Just be grateful. And thank God he stopped me. Because in that moment, what we're doing and what disgusts me that I almost did was that I'm tethering her self-expression to gratitude or a lack thereof, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're obviously not grateful because you just want blue on your thumb mm-hmm. instead of purple. Yeah. Like that makes me not a grateful person. And that's what I was almost communicating to her. So I realized that 
when I'm speaking to my kids, so often I just say things like, oh, just be grateful or, oh, just be whatever or be content. And it's like, for her to stick up for wanting blue on her thumb, which is a service that she's paying for, Uh I'm paying for, (laughs) you know, um, does not mean that she's not grateful. It just means that she knows what she wants. Yeah. And that was an opportunity for me as a mom to not allow her to bury herself underneath the need for approval or the need to avoid that side eye glance Uh to my mom. That was a moment for me to champion her and to say, I support and validate and actually value the fact that you know what you want and that it's important to you. Yeah. And to give you the confidence and the courage to speak out and say politely, would you mind not putting the blue on yeah. that thumb? I'm going to remember this next time because my daughter is like, can I have five colors on my hands? And I'm like, no, pick two. <laughs> like, just pick two and we're moving on. Yeah. So I'm going to remember, you're going to be in my head. Like, <laughs> let her pick five. I know, let her pick five or well, seven. I'm always like, just pick two and, you know, we'll move on from there. Okay, guys, I know you're loving my conversation with Juliana as much as I am, but I want to stop and thank our sponsors for today because they make the happy hour possible. The first sponsor I want to thank is Lightbox. Say hello to Lightbox, a new brand of laboratory-grown diamonds. If you've never heard of lab-grown diamonds, the biggest thing to know about them is that they have the same chemical makeup as natural diamonds but are made in a lab. And while natural diamonds are rare, Lightbox can make a lot of lab-grown ones, making them more affordable at $200 for a quarter carat, plus the cost of the setting. You wanna know my favorite thing about them is that they come in different colors. You can get them in pink, blue, or white. Pink and blue natural diamonds are so rare, you've probably never seen one before. But now you can own a lab-grown one or several. They've got necklaces and earrings for birthdays, beach days, or just because days. Treat yourself or give one as a gift to your bestie. You know Christmas is coming. I do love some pink. Check them out at lightboxjewelry.com slash happy hour. Okay, guys, I want to thank another one of our sponsors for today's show, and that is Grove. Grove is an e-commerce company that makes it easy to discover the best natural products to take care of your home and family and make sure that you never run out of your favorites. With their own safe, effective, and affordable Grove flagship products, as well as amazing brands like Mrs. Myers, Method, 7th Generation, Tom's, and Real Simple, Grove curates premium quality products that are natural, beautiful, and sustainable. Then they deliver everything right to your door when you want it. Better yet, they offer free shipping and free returns. No questions asked, you guys. And their Grove guides are always available to answer questions or add items to your next order if you run out. I love ordering from Grove for a couple of reasons. Number one, they make sure I never run out of product. I set my own schedule of what I need. If we need more, I can add it. If we need less, I can take it away. I also love getting products that I know are gonna be healthy for my family and my pets in my home. Sign up for Grove Collaborative at grove.co slash happy hour and you will receive a $30 Mrs. Myers gift set for free with your order of $20 or more. That's grove.co, not grove.com, grove.co slash happy happy hour. All right, guys, our last sponsor for today's show is Aura. You know, this year, you can be the best gift giver in your family by showing up with Aura as gifts. Aura makes gorgeous, living room-worthy smart frames that help families stay in touch seamlessly. By marrying high-end design with cutting-edge technology, Aura's smart frame will fundamentally change the way you experience photography. These aren't your typical cheap plastic digital frames that you might have had before. They're stunning designs feature an ultra high definition display and unlimited free photo storage, so you never run out of space. Aura even automatically creates collections of photos with the people that you love the most. Y'all, your dogs included, you guys, and it uses machine learning to choose the best quality photographs from your camera roll. Everyone in your family can contribute to an Aura frame from anywhere in the world with their smartphone app that lets you easily update pictures in real time. And when you give Aura as a gift, you can preload photos while it's in the box. Your lucky recipient simply needs to open it, plug it in, and enjoy. I think that's one of my favorite things about this is that you can preload the photos. What a great Christmas gift, you guys. We have the Stardust Aura Frame in our house, and we love it so much because we can all contribute photos to it and see it all the time. This would be also a great gift for grandparents or people who live out of town. One of my favorite things is it's so easy to set up. The app is so easy. Everything is so easy. So who in your family would you love to receive Aura as a holiday gift? 
Go to AuraFrames.com and use the code HAPPYHOUR to get $50 off your order. That's Aura. It's A-U-R-A frames.com. Use that code HAPPYHOUR for $50 off. Okay, guys, back to my conversation with Juliana. other things that I've seen you talk about a lot lately that I think is an interesting conversation for women to be having right now as well is the whole should conversation. This is what you should be doing. And in your, in your book, I read a part and you talked about how, when you were researching to get ready for write this, to write this book, um, which congrats on all the research. Oh my gosh. Oh, thanks. Never read any of the things you just listed. Look at you. (laughs) Wow. I was <laughs> like, oh, thanks. But what's very important to me yes. is that it wasn't just an inspiration. Yes. Book, and but. so, but you talked about how you read a lot of books um, for women. Yes. I'm assuming a lot of Christian books yes. for women. And most of them boil down to are you a, a good mom or a good wife? Right. And you saw something that I think is missing sometimes as we speak to, we'll, we'll use the Christian women context in this conversation. Okay. Um, is that there is more to being a woman than a wife and a mom. Um, I'm a wife and a mom. You're a wife and a mom. My friend Stacy that's here, she's a wife and a mom. And so I think those things are amazing. They don't define me as a woman. Right. What is your, what is your thing that you want to say to Christian women who are thinking, I mean, we have the, what if the woman is widowed? She's no longer a wife anymore. Right. Or her husband's not here. Or what about the woman who's barren and she can't, her body is not giving her the ability to have children. So this is a soapbox that I could step on and just keep going. So I'm going to stop talking (laughs) and I'm going to let you talk about it because I think it's important to talk about this. It's so important. I mean, Beyonce had it right when she's like, all those single ladies, you know, (laughs) we've forgotten about them. Yeah. You know, the moment that I realized that when I was reading all of these books on purpose and identity and womanhood, um, I was holding my infant baby in my hands, Blaze after she was first born. And it struck me in that moment that if these books are right, then my daughter has zero purpose or value right now. None. Because she doesn't, she's not married. She doesn't have kids. She doesn't have a house. She can't even read to read the word of God. She can't even speak to speak his name and, you know, um, evangelize to people. Why would God choose to create somebody who's so helpless in infancy and in mind and body, but yet still say that you're in my image and yet still call you my daughter and yet still say, let the children come to me, have faith like this. And none of them have any accolades. None of them have, have done anything. And man, it, that moment for me, rocked my world so hard because it, again, it just boils it down to where is your value? Where is your purpose coming from? And it will never be found in something that you're able to achieve or maintain. And unfortunately, relationships are also that. You, you fall in love, you maintain that relationship. We, could, we should never, ever, ever subject ourselves or others to having to achieve and maintain something to then have value and purpose before the eyes of God. Because what if you're barren? What if God calls you, you to singleness? God calls you to singleness. I mean, and, you know, what if you don't want to have kids? What if you become the CEO that your mama always wanted you to marry? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, there's, I would say to women, to Christian women in particular, just to think, Think about what it is that you're implying when you are tempted to judge, when you're tempted to have the first question you ask the single girl, oh, did you meet, are you dating anybody? Like, just think about what we're implying to our hearts because what we are implying is that your identity and your value and your worth is tethered to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it can't be that way. Yeah. Well, it can't be that way because like you said, and I've never heard that example before, if you're looking at your infant daughter and going, well, what is her value? Right. Um, Because all of those things, um, A, are not promised to us. Right. It doesn't say that anywhere. Um, And B, they can all go away. Mm -hmm. And so like what you're saying is such a great conversation of our identity is found Mm -hmm. only in Christ and Christ alone. Right. Um, And so none of those things can make me a better woman or make me less of a woman. Right. And the same thing goes for image. We do the same thing with our image. It's a little bit more personal, but I have found myself on the closet floor crying after having a baby and going, Mm -hmm. what is this body? And where did you go? Uh And who am I? And really questioning who I am as a person because 
my body's changed. Mm-hmm. I, I've also had a number of times people ask me about my hair because my hair is platinum, clearly very natural, I'm just being, <laughs> being facetious. And people will ask me, how can you talk about being confident in who you are and in your identity before God when you dye, dye your, your hair? hair. Uh-huh. And I'm like, A, I don't dye my hair. I bleach my hair. So there get, you your facts get, your, straight. get it straight. Get it straight, <laughs> A. But B, like, <laughs> you know, that's another way that we miss a, that we inappropriately tether who we are. I mean, what if I go through cancer and I lose my hair? Am, uh-huh. I, am I losing my value? Am I losing my identity as I'm losing my hair? Mm-hmm. And one of my best friends walked through cancer and she felt herself struggling with that. Yeah. And I'm going, sitting on the sidelines going, why do we do this? Why do we try and tether who we are to something as, as flippant and, and dumb as hair? Yeah. Bleached hair. Bleached hair. Not, Not even dyed, dyed hair. hair. Bleached <laughs> That's hair. Right. Get it straight. Get it straight. Uh, I mean, the logic is absurd and it sounds absurd uh-huh. and laughable and we laugh because mm-hmm. it really is, but we think this way. Yeah. So we have to reframe the way that we think yeah. about it. It's good. Um, it's it's, it's I, I'm, I'm such a fan of this conversation, um, especially for someone who you and your husband both have careers and are both still so good cheerleaders of each other and focus on your family. And I feel that's how it is at our house as well. Mm-hmm. We're both doing our thing, but we mm-hmm. are also together and we're focused on our family and cheering yeah, each awesome. other on. Um, so I've appreciated seeing you guys be cheerleaders for each other um, because I think that's important. And I would love to hear you talk about what that looks like in different seasons because y'all's, um, your careers, not mainly yours, but your husband's career is just odd and different. And there's not that many people who have careers that they, you know, technically, I know he works all year. We don't have to do that, but you know what I mean? Right. What is it? March to October. Right. And March I know he works October. in the off season, so, but I get that. Right. But y'all it's have this season. kind of different type yeah. of career. Yeah. What does it look like in the ebb and flow at the Zobers house of supporting each other in your different seasons? Yeah, we've had to learn and we've learned the hard way a little bit too. Um, Unfortunately, there was really no like how-to book as to how to be a baseball player family well, and, and is, musician and author yes. family. Well, <laughs> and I read that you guys were like, when you're dating, you're like, oh, Ben's going to be like a youth pastor. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. He was going to be a youth pastor. I was already on the road with a rock artist. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll keep doing my thing. You can be the youth pastor and yeah. carry my bags, you know? And right. now it's like, <laughs> he's got like a whole team of people carrying his bag. No, it's... um. It's different. So we're in Chicago. Well, we're in spring training in Phoenix in March, February, middle of Mar- February to end of March. You do Airbnb? We do, yes. Okay. That's so, And then it. we have the house in Chicago. So we then we moved to Chicago. And this is all of us with our kids and everything. Huh. Um, moved to Chicago. And then we're there from April, hopefully through October right. to win a World Series yeah. into November. And then from there, we moved to Nashville from... Uh, November, November, December, January, and then part of February. So a lot of my travel is also during the baseball season. We did that on purpose. We sit down every spring training with my team and then with his schedule because his schedule can't change and mine can. Right. So we have about a six hour meeting with all of us. I love it. Skype in like the team from LA Uh and like we sit down and I buy this massive calendar Mm -hmm. from, um, like Office Depot, you know, Uh the Uh life-size version. And we use Sharpies and we literally just Sharpie that makes me nervous with Sharpies. I'm a pencil girl on calendar. (laughs) Cause what if you have to change something? No, no, no. We we have like three versions of this calendar. Well, he can be in Sharpie because you said he doesn't change. (laughs) The game is always going to happen in Milwaukee or whatever. Okay, yeah. So we put in the cities that he will be in and then we kind of navigate my schedule around it. And we have what we call our six day rule. We, we don't spend any longer than six days apart. So Has that always been like y'all are sticking to it. We have stuck to it. I this. love that. We have, I mean, there have been moments where we've not yeah. been able to, but for the most part, we it's really just, yeah, have. I love it. So um, yeah, we just go through his and then we look at mine and I try and do a lot of my shows on the road where he is. So there will be times that like, I'll be out. All you the Zobrists are coming to town. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. It's so funny. So all like in the morning and our schedules are so different. So I'll like go do press in the morning, which is like a 6 a.m. call time. Uh-huh. And my kids are still sleeping until noon uh-huh. because they don't go to bed until midnight. And so we, we go, yeah, it's crazy. But then we see each other at night. 
wonderful. It's it works. crazy. It's a logistical nightmare, actually. It truly is. But, but do you feel comfortable in it? Like you, I'm with the team. I mean, it sounds like oh, you can yeah. say this is a logistical nightmare. But do you really like, okay, we're going to LA and then we're going to Boston and then yes. we're back in Chicago. Is yes. there a rhythm to that that you've kind of gotten into? Definitely. And I enjoy it so much. I think a lot of women are um, like, I could never do that. And I'm like, we're just different, different. personalities. You can handle, yes. you have a high capacity. And I love, I love uh-huh. it. My kids learned their numbers on elevator buttons, you know? They've been to literally almost every single art museum or art institute across the United States. Because on the road, so you guys cool. will do this, yeah. Yes, on the road, I always take them to the art museum. It's the best. Yes. Okay, so when you're traveling with your kids, yes, they're professional, tra- they all they have are. status. Oh, they're way... They have status. They are like, much better travelers than most adults are. They like go up to the line and you can kind of see the panic in people's eyes like, oh, oh my great. gosh, three kids. The mom with three kids, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. But they just put their stuff up on the belt, push it through, no when to walk, don't touch the <laughs> side of the security thing, you know. They know all of the things. And so they're amazing. They're how, how do you amazing. guys um, manage to do family time on the road? What does that look like? Because I know, you know, family time at our house is like, Mom and dad are both in town and we eat dinner around the table. And I know right. you have to make adjustments because that's just not how your life looks in the season. How do yeah. you guys manage family time in a new city? Um, we have about two to three hours every mid-morning afternoon with Ben. Um, he goes to the field around two, but we don't wake up until 10 or 11. Yeah. He, We usually let him sleep in too. So we only have a few hours. So we try and find a park or we like go and discover something fun or go to a museum, um, go to the hotel pool. But yeah, we just have a few hours. You just day. make it work with what you have. Yeah, we make it work. We do. What's the best thing about traveling with your kids? I, th- I think I know what you're going to say, but what's the, I want to know the best and the hardest. Oh man. Well, the best thing to me is getting to show them all of these different ways of life. I love that. I love that they are not being raised in any kind of box. <laughs> they are not. All. They are experiencing they don't even know, the world. They don't even know the definition of like a trend, you know, no. because they've just seen it all. Uh huh. And so um, I'm so grateful for that, that they've seen all different ways of life. I'm also really grateful that they've been in all different types of churches. And, you know, we might just walk down the street to a, an Orthodox mm-hmm. church, this beautiful yeah. Orthodox church or something and be able to worship there together. So for them to be able to experience all of that, I'm so thrilled to offer them that. Yeah, the hardest thing? Well, time change. Oh naps. gosh. It's the hardest. Time and y'all are all naps. checking bags? Oh yeah. Oh Getting gosh. Getting through the airport is not the hardest, but yeah, time change can be really hard for nap schedule. With your little one. With yeah. my little one. You're like, I promise it's bedtime. I Trust know, me. I know. Your body thinks it's bedtime. Exactly. Yeah, that's the Oh my part. gosh. Um, okay, so you're pretty active on social media. Yes. I love it. I Thanks. love social media as well. I love Instagram. Are you, do you do Twitter a lot? I don't. I, I mean, Twitter my stresses Instagram me out. feeds into my tr- Twitter, which feeds into my Facebook. But no, I'm, I love my community on Instagram. Twitter stresses me out. I can't, yeah. like, I literally think I go over there and my blood pressure just goes up. I'm like, <laughs> everyone's nice That's on That's how Inst- I feel about Facebook. Oh, wait, I can't handle that either. I know. I like Instagram. I do. I love Instagram. People are so nice for the most part. Well, yeah. You get haters. We all get haters, yeah. I don't get that many because I don't have as many people. I, mean, I guess I do, but they're smaller. How yeah. do you handle that? The haters? Yeah. Does I it bother them? you? Does yeah. it bother you? Of course it does. Okay. Yeah, it hurts. It Do you always lose sleep hurts. or you just kind of? No, okay. no, I don't. I usually just have to say it out loud, like to somebody. Like, can you like, believe what this person friend, just like, said? Uh-huh. Somebody just said this. So I'm just telling you and then I'm over it. And sometimes I might even need to like write it down. Um, I usually- I did that yesterday. I screenshotted something and sent it to two of my girlfriends. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, look at this. Yeah. And of course, you know, they're like- Right. Yeah. So- uh, if it's really bad, if it's sexual or if it's highly offensive or if it's towards my family, I block, block immediately Yeah, and report. You can block and report? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to report it first and then you block. You got it down, girl. <laughs> girl, I got this down. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. Oh. Um, but you're active there, but you also, do you feel that as one of your best places to reach women and to be outspoken about the things that you're passionate about? Absolutely. And I honestly... The haters are so minimal. I love 
this community of people. I yeah, really the, do. Yeah, those truly people, do. your community outshines and out. Oh my their voice goodness. is louder. Uh, without a doubt. And I, I think that social media can kind of get a bad rap as being the source of comparison or the source of like, we feel bad about ourselves because we follow the sexy yoga mm-hmm. girls and we, yeah. you know, whatever. <laughs> right. Um, but I think that it really is a, an amazing opportunity to see like what beauty looks like globally, what success looks like for other people and just allow it to kind of educate your your mind, expand the way that you think to be able to see that everyone does life differently. Yeah. And, and everyone's version of success is different and that's okay. And everyone back to the image of God thing is carrying a different image of God. Mm-hmm. They don't unfollow them yeah. because she seems to be more successful than you. Another woman's success is never your failure. I say this all the time. And I say it to myself still, other women's success is not your failure. They're just gifted differently, yeah. you know? And They're, we can cheer them on. And we can cheer them on. Yeah. The most confident women I know are the most championing of other women. Yeah. Now, I will admit, I have unfollowed people, not because they're doing anything wrong, but because my heart needs to get a little bit more balanced. Does okay. that make sense? Like so? I, okay, so I just, my most recent unfollow was a woman I don't even know. Um, and she t- talks a lot about yoga. And I've done yoga like five times. <laughs> <laughs> I said sexy yoga girl. And no, like, I, know. I this didn't is, even. This is why I'm remembering. <laughs> didn't even I don't even know, know her story. name. That's the thing. Like I don't okay, even know yeah. her. Um, but I started to feel like, you know what? I think I need to get my brain, take a little break from this. Mm-hmm. But I actually am like the most secure in who I am and that I've ever been. Yeah. And so for me, it was a matter of, I just need to take a little bit of a break because she's not doing anything wrong. Right. Like, and I'm happy for her. Yeah. I just need to take a break yeah, from absolutely. sexy yoga girl yeah. before I get back into yoga because yoga is hard for me. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's just being smart and knowing yeah, yourself. Yeah, it, it is. Like totally if, ignore myself. If you, you know, lose a pet, you might want to just unfollow like the puppy dog page for yes. a while or yes. something. like. I mean, you're just being smart with your totally. heart. Totally, totally. Which my puppies do have an Instagram page. They do? Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's weird. Yes. So <laughs> that is so weird. I think it's super weird when people have their their kids have Instagram pages. Mine don't. I mean, it's, I'm like I have, all for oh, it. My 14 That's year old fine. does. You, you mean do like it? a young kid? I mean, like the babies. Okay, they'll yeah. just go ahead and just put like. I kind of love okay. it though because they're like. <laughs> well, I have thought <laughs> to like not Aaron date you. <laughs> no, I'm like Aaron. We need to grab our kids' names. They don't need to use them, but like, oh let's get God, them an email address. Right. <laughs> let's let's buy their webpage. What if they grow up to be like a singer and and they can't get Deacon Ivy because someone. Someone else has it. I'm like, we need to get it now. We oh have my it. word! Your kid's name's Deacon. Deacon. Uh huh. I love. That. I know. It's a sweetie. So oh, you should buy really your kids' sweet. web pages. Just yeah, hold on I to totally them. Totally should. Somebody already probably has. I know. And then they're going to charge us. I had, to, buy I had to get mine. I had to buy mine from somebody. I know. You did. Yeah. Well, I tried to get it years ago, and he was like, no. And then it's kind of a sad story. And then when I went back to get it, he, it was for his wife, and they'd gotten a divorce, oh, and so okay. I got it pretty cheap, but. He was happy to get rid of it then. Yeah, he was. And I was like, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> Jamie Ivy. Um, okay, so I, I love social media as well. And I think that it can be used for so much good. And yeah. I have loved the community that, that I too. have gotten as well. Um, awesome. Is it weird for your kids to be out and people are like, I know your mom? Yeah, that is very weird for them. Um, I talk to them a lot about just the reality of that. And they always kind of hit this age around five, six where it really hits them hard. And um, I try and protect them as much as I can from, like I don't take pictures with fans with my children in it. And we don't do any signatures or allow any fan, anything at our home. So we really kind of set a very clear boundary there. You said you didn't don't do anything at your home. Um, like Would fan, other people do fan, that? Like fans show up at your house? No, no, no. Not, I'm well, yeah, they out. do. They do. And that's okay. I just know like it's not fan- okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> not okay. <laughs> no. Oh, I just mean fan mail or okay, like okay, gifts got it, got or it. people bringing things over for us to sign. Fans will do that. They'll show up like to have a sign thing. And that's just sort okay. of our line in, line the, in sand. the sand. We don't do anything at home. We don't talk about. I mean, we talk about baseball kind of. Because it's as, like your dad's, dad's job. job. Yeah. But we don't talk about baseball. Uh-huh. We don't allow those conversations. We don't talk all of the tour scheduling around the kids. We just really try and protect them. It's a very like quote unquote typical, this is our family. Yes. 
Yes, which is of good. utmost importance. I us. love that. Yeah. I love that. Um, my kids, now that they're older, 14, 13, 12, 10, mm-hmm. I will be like, hey, can I put that picture I just took of you on Instagram? Yes. And I have one that almost all the time will say no. Yeah. One yeah. kid. And then I have yeah. another one's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my picture. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I'm like, okay, we have a problem. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> That's the one I need to get the webpage for. Uh, but anyhow. Yes, uh, okay, what are you loving these days? And what are you reading? Oh, man. I am loving reading these days, actually, to be honest. And I'm still reading heady stuff? Or do you also like... Like a fiction. Do you like, or what do you, what do you? I don't really read much fiction. Okay. I really don't. I read a lot of poetry. Um, David White right now, Mm -hmm. Consolations. I'm finishing Plato's Fido right now. Um, Marcus Aurelius, The Emperor's Handbook is one of my favorites. Um, I'm reading multiple things at once. Oh, I'm also reading um, A Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Mm -hmm. Frankl, Mm -hmm. which it's um, his story of being, in a concentration camp. Okay. Um, so that's, yeah, I love, I do love Do you read it. a book book or on a device? Oh, book book. Oh, oh me yeah. too. Oh, girl, yes. And I, I got to hold it in my hand. Yeah. And I got to mark all the pages. Do you smell books? <laughs> yeah, totally. I have a friend, our friend Annie, she, every time she gets a new book, she opens it and smells it. Oh, I just love it. So I actually stack like all 12 of the books that I'm sort of working uh-huh. through next to my bed so I can smell them. And just but then when you travel, them. you just pick one with you? Yeah, usually three with me. Okay. I had I brought two yesterday. I was a yeah. little like, I don't know which one I might want to read. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Bring them both. Yeah. Uh, what are you loving these days? Oh, being outside. I am loving me. I love the fall. I love watching the leaves change. It's nice here in Nashville. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's I beautiful. love a fireplace. I love, you Have know, you had a fire yet? Oh, yeah. We did too the oh, other I night. I it on as soon as I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love a fire. If This is like in the in the summer, my happiest place is like outside with air and grilling, a glass of wine, a yes. book, my kids yes. like playing and not fighting. Oh, it's so And good. in the winter, if there's a fire on and the whole family's like around the kitchen and Aaron's cooking, I'm like, this is my perfect night ever. Oh, it is so perfect. Literally yesterday, my girlfriend came over with her three kids and— um, we live like in an apartment above a barn here in Nashville. <laughs> we live in a barn. Uh-huh. And um, we can see the hill that kind of goes up on, alongside our house. We can see onto the hill and we could see all of the kids uh-huh. just playing oh. in the woods and throwing rocks and just having fun and uh, making a house for a lizard, like coming up and getting the hot glue gun, right. you know, my oldest son. So I just love that. I love the ease of life, the pace of life here. It's a nice break. And you get it for like four months. Yeah. Well, I don't really, but yeah, for this next two weeks, I do. Yeah. It's great. And then you're back at it again. Then we're back at it. Oh, um, girl, it has been so great to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for thank coming. You so thank you much. for your message. Thank you for speaking to women. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for modeling a marriage where you can cheer your husband on and you can also chase yeah. your dreams. Um, I think that's important. And so- Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. So I welcome. love your spirit. I feel like I know you. I love it. You guys, I'm so thankful for this conversation with Juliana and her honesty about her faith. We sat down together at a hotel in Nashville, and I adored getting to know her. She was everything I thought she would be from following her on Instagram. The studying that she did to find what was true in her belief about being created in the image of God, it is inspiring. I hope that you are going to be encouraged to wrestle with those big theology questions in your own heart. Juliana's book is available anywhere books are sold. Visit her webpage and you can find her music there. And guys, always remember, I had someone the other day tell me that while they were listening to, it was our holiday gift guide episode, that they were scribbling down everything they could at their daughter's gymnastic practice. I just want to remind you, we put everything online for you. Go to jamieivy.com. You're going to find the recaps from the podcast. We're going to have links to everything we talk about. So if you forget something, put it down. But I will tell you this, if you are a scribbler, you need to get our podcast notes notebook that we have up in our store. It's super cute and it's a place for you to take notes for all of the podcasts that you listen to. Today's show was edited by Chris with Podshaper and the music was developed for the show by Matt Graham. Next week, my guest almost didn't happen and Amy Wolf is gonna tell us the story of how she almost didn't make it on the show. We talk about jealousy and friendship and emails gone wrong and our worth. It is such a great interview. You're going to wanna take lots of notes next week on that show 
show. You guys enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend and have a happy hour with a friend. I'll see you guys back here next Wednesday with my friend, Amy Wolf. <laughs>